Ain't no prerequisite for hip hop And some of y'all going black Not really hip not Hip hop is before rapping Long before N.W.A. started busting caps in Long before Dre saw D and he started snapping Long before the mayor of D.C. yelled out in trapping Yep, hip hop was peace So brothers bought gaps and clips Man, she was fine till our daughter start showing their hips And she was cool till cash did the takeover And she was fair till labels did the rape over The whole game need a makeover Man, I've been doing this for years I ain't no play soldier They say that rappers are dogs just like Calvin Brodus They call Kid Rock and MC Come on now, that's focus We losing our kids to the streets Better take notice Bling, bling, eating a brain like a field of locusts In ten years, you'll look back and ask who wrote this A visionary who can see without puffing smoke here Turn that knob on your vision, man, and get focused Fold the game, disappear like hocus pocus Come on Turn that knob on your vision, man, and get focused What's up, fam? What's up? What's up? What's up? What's happening? It's your boy, Tony Briscoe, in the building. Yes, it is Friday, June 4th, 2021, and I am grateful to be here with you once again. Coming off a pretty interesting week in the world, I can't say enough of what is going on around the world. You know, UFOs and everything. Not going to get into all of that tonight because, well, we just don't know what exists and we don't know what is out there. But nonetheless, Grateful to be with you all on another Friday on Tony Briscoe Live. Thank you for tuning in. As always, I'd like to give a disclaimer that um, uh, I am hosted on this platform through Be In The Mix uh, Media Group. Uh, my thoughts are not their thoughts. And so don't hold them accountable if I say anything offensive to anyone. And also my guests who will be on are not necessarily their views or not mine. So don't hold me accountable for what um, someone else will say. I do like to hold good dialogue. I do like to ask great questions. And most of uh, what I do is unscripted because I like natural conversations that I have with my audience and with my guests when they come on to Tony Briscoe uh, live. Um, so before I bring in my first guest, I do want to talk about mental health um, and talking about mental health awareness. We want to send our support to uh, Naomi Osaka for taking a break from the French Open so she was fine for not uh, showing up for interviews, and she just chose to step away altogether from the French Open so she could take care of herself. It's amazing that people have to explain even after, well, during COVID, because COVID is not over with, despite people opening back up like crazy. That's another part of the segment, though. But shout out to her for acknowledging that her self-care is very important and doing what she has to do to take care of herself. So we stand with you, sister. And what does it look like for others standing with her? Well, the Calm app said that they will pay her fines for her not showing up. And so I think that is just an awesome way to support those who are dealing with mental health issues. It's not something we really talk a lot about with athletes because we expect them to be on 24 seven and perform to entertain us, um, you know, without without remorse or without care and concern for themselves. And so Definitely wanted to mention that this week, uh, something major that took place. Um, also, the Los Angeles Lakers will not be able to defend their title. They were taken out in the first round uh, of the playoffs. Um, you know, shout out to uh, the Lakers. Notice I did not say LeBron and the Lakers because no one man is a team. And so y'all know I'm not that deep into sports. I only am lately because of my daughter and her a uh, player she loves dearly, Anthony Davis, uh, who was out also with an injury. But uh, I, I want to make this statement about LeBron James. Now, we can debate about LeBron all day. Um, and is he greater than Michael? We, we can have debates about that stuff all day. Um, I, I do think there are areas where, you know, sticking around to support the other team, like that's just stuff that's got to be done. But I know he knows those guys and he'll probably call them, congratulate them on his own time. You know, you have to understand that athletes are human. And when they lose, man, like they lose. They don't intend on showing what we perceive as bad, uh, bad sportsmanship. Now, walking off the court five minutes early during the game. Yeah, that, that's another story there. But I will say this. Why don't we want LeBron James to be great? Why don't we want him to be better than Michael Jordan? I'm just I'm just curious as to why we don't want LeBron to be great. Why is it that when we have our images of an older generation, right, 
a generation that was great. Like we never going to take anything away from Michael Jordan, like at all. Let's just make that clear. But why don't we want a younger person to be greater than him? Are we holding on to icons forever? Is that still why we're talking about Mayor Harold Washington after all these years? Not just that he was a great mayor, but do we not want anybody to be greater than him? Right. I think this is an issue for our younger generation and the stress that's on their lives by some of the older generation. Not everybody, because not everybody feels that way. All I'm saying is that if LeBron believes he's better than Michael Jordan, that shouldn't be a problem. Muhammad Ali was getting knocked out and still saying he was the greatest. So what's wrong with having that type of confidence level on the court? Right. We can debate issues about how he does things. People call him a crybaby. They call him a flopper. You can say whatever you want. Right. At the end of the day, I think the bigger issue is that we just don't want to see young people be great. We want to cling on to the ancestors and not just learn from them. We want to hold on tight to them. Look, let's call it this. LeBron has elevated the game of basketball. That is clear. LeBron is a hard player. That is clear. LeBron has been on three different teams and has three different championships with each of them. That is clear. 18 career playoff games is the first time he's been knocked out in the first round. That is clear. But I want you to look at what we offer up to a generation like LeBron James when, oh, you're good, but you're never better than or you won't be better than. I think we need to let that go. I think we need to acknowledge LeBron for who he is and what he's brought to the game of basketball. And I think we need to really take into close consideration that when we put our words on people, when we put our mouths on people by saying they're not better than this person because of this and because of this, we can go tit for tat with all the things that LeBron James has done for the community versus what other players have done for the community. At the end of the day, are you great? Are you great at what you do? Are you the best at what you do? And how do you want to be perceived by the world? It's time to let our young people be great. Everybody doesn't need our opinions. And I will say this before I bring my guest on. Chicago, June 11th is opening back up. I don't know what happened to COVID, but all of a sudden we are go live. You know, it's really funny that people have been hating the mayor for a long time. They've been hating the governor Pritzker here in Illinois for a long time. Oh, you guys have got too much of a clampdown on us. And then when they open up, everybody's asking, well, why are we opening up so soon? I mean, they you just cannot win as a politician. And y'all know I don't give Democrats no pass. I don't give Republicans no pass, specifically in Illinois. It deals with Democrats primarily and then Republicans on the back end. Regardless, we're opening back up. I will continue to wear my mask in public. That's just my choice. Um, I don't believe, you know, this disease is going anywhere. This virus, whatever you want to call it, the pandemic, you know, I believe I don't want to be I'm, I'm going to be extra cautious. That's all I'm saying. And so each is own. If you don't want to wear a mask after they say don't wear a mask, then don't wear a mask. But don't knock people who do. Don't knock people who don't. Let's just be us. All right. So with that news out of the way, I'd like to bring on my first guest by the name of Otis Woods. He is the secretary of WC4RJ, that is the Workers' Center for Racial Justice. I hope I did not screw that up, my brother. You did a great job, man. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me, man. Absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. So I know there are some things you want to talk about today. But uh, if you don't mind, I'm going to also bring in my other guest because I think he will find not only this topic interesting, I think he will align it somehow with the community work that he's doing and what he's trying to do to increase the intelligence of African history and of African-American history. And I'm going to get on him later on when I get him on because he know I'm going to talk about that quiz he had me fill out that I bombed bad. So we'll get into that. But I also want to introduce to everybody, Mr. Eddie Phillips. Hey everybody! Hey, hey, hey! Can you hear me? Am I good? Am I good? I'm, I'm loud. Yeah, <laughs> I was, I was rushing good. in. I was rushing in. Uh, thank you for having me on here, man. I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, please meet uh, brother Otis Woods. He is the secretary for the brother Workers Otis. Center for Racial Justice. He has a clarion call for the community, and I'd like mm -hmm. him to go ahead and talk about what the what, what the organization has going on what the organization is about and how the community can help with their efforts for racial justice. 
Cool. Thank again. Thanks for uh, Mr. Best for having me on, and I appreciate you. Uh, again, my name is Otis Woods. I'm a leader at the Working Center for Racial Justice, and I also serve as the secretary of the Policy Steering Committee. Uh, the Policy Steering Committee is made up of WCRJ leaders and plays a diverse role in shaping and advancing organ organization, city, and policy state agenda. The Working Center for Racial Justice is a nonprofit Black liberation organization uh, formed by a group of formerly incarcerated people. We have been fighting since 2012 to eliminate underemployment, uh, unemployment and overcriminalization in our communities, along with organizing black workers. We craft and introduce bold and truly transformative legislation around criminal justice reform, uh, mm -hmm. workers' rights, civil rights, and police accountability measures. For example, the Illinois Black Caucus just passed an historical uh, criminal ominous bill. And I'm proud to be a member and supporter of WCGR played an instrumental role in shaping and advancing that anonymous bill on criminal justice. Since the nationwide for black liberation began last summer with the George Floyd uh, incident and the global pandemic, uh, WCGR has been mobilizing thousands of local residents to participate in direct actions and policy advocacy with Illinois lawmakers and issues pertaining to realize to, uh, to to racialize, to racialize police violence and mass incarceration. So our members and supporters of WCGR play, our members have spoken with Illinois legislators and filled out witness slips, placed out phone calls, and sent more than 40,000 emails urging action around on key racial uh, justice legislations. So we secured some victories. Uh, the Omnibus Bill adopted police accountability language drafted by the WCGR with outlaw discretion of police conduct. And as a member of Chicago Coalition, Coalition to End Money Bond, WCRGA supported the fight to end the rationalized practice of pretrial incarceration. So that's huge, right? We are the first state in the nation to abolish cash bail for uh, pretrial. So that's pretty huge and I'm proud of that work. And my attention here today is to inform your audience about how the Working Center for Racial Justice is fighting to protect our democracy by leveraging grassroots power through our ballot initiatives. All right, the fight to dismantle systems of anti-Black police brutality. One of our ballot initiatives is community oversight of the Chicago Police Board. We are fighting to dismantle systems of anti-Black police brutality in our neighborhoods by ensuring that voters like yourself and your listeners will elect members of the Chicago Police Board. So we are working to get a referendum question on the ballot uh, in 2020 to elect to have an elected police board. The petition will only allow this question to be asked so that voters like yourself will have a voice regarding who's on the Chicago Police Board. Currently, the nine members of the Chicago Police Board is elected by the, solely elected by the mayor with the advice and consent on the city council. For decades, the Chicago Police Board, which governs the rules and regulations of CPD, has lacked the independence needed to effectively regulate the department and abolish systemic officer abuse. So the police board has continued to be protected in, in fatal shootings, and, and we haven't seen that uh, throughout the history of Chicago. And this is how we fight back. This is without asking, all right? If Chicagoans vote yes on this question, the law will automatically go into effect and the Chicago police board will be elected by the people. And what we need, we need 85,000. So go ahead. Yeah, Otis, let, 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 let's, let's back up for a little bit. And you know, it, it's not to knock, like I appreciate, I appreciate the script. I, I got all that, but mm -hmm. I want to be able to engage in a little bit of dialogue here, especially when it comes to I'll need you to explain, and and uh, uh, Mr. Phillips, if, if you know details as well, please add in. I, I need you to explain the purpose of getting rid of the cash bail system and what that means for those violent offenders who do get incarcerated. Um, because I look at it as, yes, we can say get rid of the cash bail system, which has been done. Mm -hmm. What Because on the flip side, that could mean also, correct me if I'm wrong, that a judge can say you don't get bail at all. Yes. So tell us about the cash bail system, why it was put in that mix and the purpose for it and how it serves the community. Well, 
as a, it was, the justice system is disproportionately affecting black people. Uh, we are economically poor and we usually uh, sit in the uh, jail cell because we can't pay cat, we can't pay the bond. All right, free trial. So yes, the judge, if it, if the cash bail system rolls out, yes, it will be uh, according to the judge's discretion. But then again, we have to be uh, informed voters to uh, vote for our judges. So this is just a system to keep the checks and balances, and that's why I was placed in that uh, in the mix like that. Okay. Yeah, so that's cool. So is there a reason then that there's not an emphasis on judges versus an emphasis on putting a cash bail system in place that a judge doesn't even have to honor? Uh, well, I think it's a stepping stone to, to equity. It's a stepping stone. I mean, it's a step-by-step -step process in policies and, and, and uh, yeah. in politics, right? So our first goal is to even, let, even the playing field economically, and then we attack the problem for judge discretion. Then we can type that in the next step. That would, that's how I would respond to that. Let's go for it. Yeah. And so uh, in other words, we can't just afford to, go ahead. But yeah, we can't afford to just fight one angle at a time. Say it one more time. We Say can't afford to just fight one angle. We have to fight multiple angles at a time. That is true, but when it comes to policies, you want to be specific one at a time. You just can't fight all four fronts at the same time. You do it sometimes systematically, right? So all these different issues we got, but we, all these different issues you have, you might not have the people problem, right? So you have to at least let, you know, get the top three issues down. What can we focus our most resources to? And then go attack that first thing, cross it out the list, then go in, then move to the second thing. Uh, but Mr. Briscoe, I don't want to be rude. I, my intention was not to talk about the criminal ominous bill. My intention here is to, Get that police board oversight in those these eighty five thousand signatures, and I really want to educate educate your audience because that's the next step. All right, so we on a ballot. No, no. Yeah, yeah, there. Yeah. That that's cool. That that's cool. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. I just still have to, you know, lay a foundation mm -hmm. of credibility. Um, you know, like while you speak, so. Yeah. Mr. Phillips, can you hear me? Because I'm—he's—is uh, it me breaking up or him? No, I he hear right you. Uh, I think it's, 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 there. All right, I don't know. I got cut off. I don't know if you heard me or not. Yeah, I think your Wi-Fi. Um, I think your Wi-Fi was off there for a little bit. It's my Wi-Fi, not your Wi-Fi. Yeah, yeah. Mr. Phillips, here. Yeah, so go ahead. Ah, oh, okay. So, like I was saying, my 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 intent here is to gather, uh, inform your audience about gathering signatures. We need eighty five thousand signatures. That's the goal to get this question on the ballot. All right. So we always complain as a community about this police 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 brutality, but this is a perfect opportunity for people to show effort to get these eighty five thousand signatures mm -hmm. on the ballot, and we vote yes. It's automatically Chicago Police will be elected. All right. Our plan is to get one hundred and seventy thousand signatures. So we get a challenge so that we can already be prepared. All right, so we already have uh, a team that's on a daily basis, Monday through Friday, um, calling people to become gather signatures, signature gatherers. Uh, and my job as a secretary is to create relationships with different partners and organizations in the community, such as yourself and any other organization that's out there that's listening to me right now and the work that I'm describing that resonates with you. Please uh, give me. Please contact me. Uh, I can drop my email in the chat box, and please visit our website. Uh, if you want to be, if you want to sign a petition or become a petition gatherer yourself, that would be dope. Uh, you know, again, once we get these eighty-five thousand signatures, that question will be on the ballot, and then it will be left up to the people, and we can't complain anymore about anybody but ourselves at that point. And that's my and that's my take on it. That's what I really wanted to inform your audience about. Work here. No, no, that's no, that that's that's live, that's live, and that's cool. Um, I I think it's and I think now and now I'm in. The, I'm sorry. Now you like going to take a little bit of dialogue. I'm definitely down. I'm definitely <laughs> no, 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 that's 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 cool. You know, I I like to you know I, I always like to interject because I like to have a a, a conversation uh, when it comes to things like this um, as well. Um, you know. What kind of pushback has the organization received about their efforts in regard to having a people elected police board? Well, one pushback is the, the, the pandemic, right? We have not yet, you know, to get it as hard to engage people during the pandemic. I've been, uh, so that's been a, a barrier. And one barrier is also fear, uh, you know, this fear in itself. That's been one barrier that I have been encountering. Uh, 
with the gathering and support board. What do you mean by fear? So fear uh, of tags, for example, a neighbor, I was talking to a neighbor and explaining that she said she works for CPD. So she's like, I don't want to, uh, don't want to um, participate in that. Or another person that said that I'm going to retire. So I don't know why he said that, but he don't want to know, you know, no issues or no backlash. So there's things like that. Before, I just don't think they're really informed about the, uh, the ballot initiative, about how they connect it. But that's just some uh, dialogue that I have encountered. I always have one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Oh, Mr. Phillips, you have any questions for him? No, I, I just wanted to note that, that that issue of fear, that's 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 historic. Um, that, that that issue of fear uh, pretty much guides a lot of our decisions and a lot of things, a lot of our experiences in this black community, what we're dealing with. Um, you know, the fear of it, it works many different ways. The fear of talking about the criminality, the fear of countering the criminality, the fear of uh, being the person, you know, that stands up to say no, and the, the, the fear of even getting involved as a community. And some of that comes from the historic idea, too, of, you know, you, I, I'm going to have to say it the way it is. You're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. You know, they feel that way. And we got to try to get that out of people. So I, that's an honorable thing to do, my brother, to keep trying to work through that fear. Cool. Uh, any other questions? Is any uh, maybe any pushback you have? Any suggestions that any more? Any suggestions where we can outreach to people more? Connect with people uh, more? Yeah, no, I don't. I don't. I don't bring guests on for pushback when they have an initiative that they are, you know, wanting to push through. We can we can come back at another time for a conversation like that to dialogue. But it's, I don't. I don't want to take away from the work that has to be done. Right. If if I'm pushing back now and asking questions, like you know, let's let's keep this one hundred. I'm not a journalist. I'm here to support my people in the efforts that they have and engage Amen. the community on how we can be better as a people and how we can be better as a country and how we can be better as a nation. And so I do got some pretty, you know, we've talked before, so I've got some pretty hard questions, but it's not to debate. It's just to say that, you know, you're going to be pushed on this more than once, but there's an agenda that's for the people in our community, for African-Americans specifically, and I want to be the one to support those efforts. I don't want to come on as the one who's asking the hard questions and seem like I'm giving pushback. We'll, we'll save that for another show so we can have a great dialogue and dialect about that. But for now, I'm here to support what WCRJ is here to support in the work for uh, for racial justice and equity within our court system. That That's why I'm here and that, that's why you're here. We can deal with the debate stuff another day. Today's not the day for that. That's huge. All right, cool. I appreciate that. I appreciate yep. that. You so got again, it. I just we I just that's why I'm here for that's my intent. Uh, I dropped the chat the link uh, in, your, in your chat box for those who are interested in uh, gathering uh, gathering petitions for us. That's in the link. I'm also gonna put my email address if anybody's interested. They can contact me. All right, sounds good. Well, thank you for your time, my brother. I hope to catch you tomorrow. <laughs> uh, I will be able to on out the champ. I definitely see that with my blaze on. <laughs> cool, cool, man. All right, I'll catch you tomorrow, man. All right, cool. Thank you for having right, me again. Absolutely. All good, right, man. all right. The Workers Center for Racial Justice has an effort that they're putting forth for the community to sign a petition so we can get a referendum on the board for an elected police board. Hmm, wonder how that elected school board thing is going, but <laughs> we'll save that. For another day. I am anxious to get into this conversation with right. Mr. Phillips. So first, before he even does an introduction, I got to get on this brother. I, I think I met him through Pastor Henry, <laughs> but um, I've got to say this. This brother challenged the known social media world to take a black or African history quiz. How many questions was it, Eddie? Uh, it's eleven. It's, it was, was just it eleven 12? questions. It's eleven. It was just eleven questions. It may seem like it, it was, was more. even eleven it was questions. Even. Ooh, it felt like fifty, man. I'm telling you, because because it makes the you easiest think. thing to do would have been the Google, right? <laughs> yeah, they they made me think the easiest thing to do uh -huh. would have been to Google the answers. And so I was like, yeah, who wants to go out like that? I can front and say, yeah, I knew all 11, but if I Googled them, I ain't know nothing. I believe <laughs> I got three of the 11 questions right. And one I had to get from my wife. Okay, let me make that clear. And what? then I had a good friend who's a doctor I used to work with. Um, he guessed, I think he guessed five of them. 
Uh, he had five of them, but he told me three of his were just good guesses, and he used the process of elimination. And so, yeah. Eddie, talk to us about your network. Give everybody the correct pronunciation in case I'm saying it wrong, and then the purpose of your network. So the, the name is the Erudition Network. Erudition means understanding, means wisdom. Uh, and what I what what we try to do is to provide black history. Um, that is, I, I, I neglect lately to say uh, stolen. I don't believe that. I believe that it is more hidden than stolen. And so what we try to do is provide history that has been hidden from us, um, that is not taught in our in our uh, kindergartens through 12th grade, and sometimes even in our colleges. Um, we try to go and provide that history sources, uh, primary and secondary. Uh, we try to, like with that test, with that quiz, to ask the questions because to, that, that will, will make you, you know, delve further into your history. The, the real purpose of the Erudition Network, as I believe that God, God has inspired me to do, is to allow people to delve into their history, give them the sources that they need to learn on their own, right? Uh, that test is that we, that you talked about is really to pique your curiosity to go well. What don't what don't I know, right? What don't what you know? What, what is my conditional thought that I think that I understand about history? And then what what that does is it makes you go, man. I really don't know as much as I thought I knew. And then you want to go further. So, erudition's job that the purpose is to educate not just black uh, everyone because black history is American history. And we have to understand and accept that um, through our, you know, as we go through our lives. And so lastly, what I will say is that history sculpts who we are, right? The, your understanding of history, um, what you think you know about yourself uh, presents in your daily life. Uh, psycholo psychologists call it transduction, right? You, you, you take information in, your body responds to it, your mind, soul, spirit responds to it, and you guide yourself further uh, in your day-to-day, -day, everything you do, by what you think you know and what you think you understand about yourself. So if your history is corrupted or hidden and you don't really know who you are, then you're going to make decisions based off of what you think you know. Yeah, that, that, that's awesome. And, and thank you for speaking that. My, my next question for you is with the absence or I shouldn't say absence of African-American history, but with the lack of education around it, how much do you think that shapes our identity and what we actually don't know about ourselves and who we are? Oh, it greatly shapes our identity because not only do we not know who we are, we have taken on um, information from people who tell us who they think we are um, because a lot of them don't know. This is why Erudition is also trying to educate everyone because what happens is we do have certain select people. You know, back when, uh, when, when I was uh, a young man, a kid, they used to say, remember in Living Color and different things would say, the man, right? It's the man trying to keep you down. It's the man. But it's not really a man. It's 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 <laughs> right. the system. It's a it's a system that has been in place even before um, our recognized understanding of slavery, um, and so it shapes everything. I'll give you one. I'll give you an example, Tony. When 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 well, I think it was the New York Times when they came up with the sixteen nineteen project, which I think is honorable for us to talk about Black history in any kind of way. But when we start our history as in the idea of when we came into bondage. Right. That that that's 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 improper. What what that's doing is that's informing our people, a lot of people who don't know that, hey, OK, uh, black folks started in this country in slavery. But we don't talk about earlier history. We don't talk about the African nations. We don't talk about the uh, exploration and the, and the biblical understandings of, that, of us being in the Bible, touching all these other cultures. And so when our children and our people don't know that. And they only think that, well, we were enslaved. And think about this. Your the kids are taught from kindergarten all the way up until 12th grade, because that's, that's, some people don't go to college, that their history started with slavery. And if you're sitting in a room with yeah. multi multicultural people, and every time, every year, over and over again, they go, and, and 
Blacks were slaves. Blacks were slaves, right? Um, oh, what is that? So when that happens, one of my kids is blasting, blasting their music. Uh, hold on a second. Uh, just I put him on mute for a little bit because the, the, the sun is getting it in up in there. You're going you're gonna to make them ban my video, man, because you got some Lecrae up in there. Now. No, he was doing up in there. <laughs> but um, what, I I was know, say, <laughs> what I was saying is this, that uh, we really, really, really have to know who we are. And so we spend so much time. And you're absolutely right. It shapes us. It shapes us. And that's why we have so many. A lot of the problems that we have in the community are because of the way we've been shaped by our history. Yeah, so exactly then, what is the approach to, because now we have to talk about the system of education that we're in. And if it's believed or perceived that, hey, you were in Africa, this is your start of your, this is the start of your existence in America, though. Like, how do we break through that gap in education, especially now when even with the 1619 Project, there are people, primarily conservatives and Republicans, who believe that it's teaching people to hate America, which is all rhetoric, rhetoric that stemmed up from 45, rhetoric that is stemmed up from a lot of these Republicans who supported 45. Like, what do you say to that when, even with teaching the 1619 Project, that they think it's anti-patriotic, anti-American, and that they think it's in itself is reverse racism? Well, that's, there's hypocrisy to that, and, and, I, and, I, and I'll explain why. If, if you were to pick up, let's say, a fifth grader's history book right now, and you were to go through that book, um, they talk about the, uh, the Renaissance. They talk about the Spanish Inquisition. They talk about European thoughts. They talk about the philosophers. They talk about the Greeks. They talk about the Romans. And they go and they go and they go and they talk about uh, the Vikings and they talk about the Catholic Church and they teach these thousands of years of pre-American life. And we know that atrocities happened in those cultures and those times, right? But they teach that to our children as if that because they tell them that this is relevant for you to be able to survive in this current world. So you need to know about the Renaissance and then all of these things. But what they failed to do, I, I one of one of our programs I showed, there is a map and they showed the maps of all of these different cultures coming to the Americas, right? Finding the Americas. And what they neglected to talk about were the blacks who came over here or the, the people from Africa. And they neglected to talk about the evidence that was left. And anytime we talk about um, the, 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 the African history that is there for us to find, it is not stolen, it is just hidden. And so once it comes out, and I'm gonna tell you the funny, well, there's another funny part to that. Very often the people who discover or unhide, unhide our history are whites, right? White people who write books, who go, hey, all of a sudden, did you know that such and such a happened? The other day we were talking about Memorial Day. And we were talking about how the first uh, Memorial Day was established because free slaves, right? Decided to honor the, the, the graves of white soldiers, white Union soldiers who had been prisoners. And it was a white man who he said he was researching the book and came across it and said, oh, this is the hit. The history is not stolen. It is merely hidden. And so to, to answer your question more, more, more distinctly is the fact that we have to take the time because they're taking the time every day. When our kids study history, we have to take the time. I tell people put erudition on as a background noise. If you need to just to spark conversation, mm -hmm. right? In your own home, with your own kids, with your own nieces, nephews, families, church members, friends. Because we have to get over this idea of being afraid of our history. And once we can do that, we can move forward and being able to talk. Our history, Tony, honestly, is painful. There are so many painful things in black American history and even in African history. Very painful. But if we get over that fear of, I don't want to talk about it because that was horrible. No, our kids need to know where they come from. 
They need to know who they are, right? And so that's why, uh, that's the first step. That's the very first step. The gentleman earlier, get, get over the fear. That's why I specified that. That fear drives black America. Yeah. Yeah, no, that that's good. That's good. That's good. I'm going to start calling you Dr. Phillips, by the way, just because I can, you know. <laughs> but I, I say that to say you're absolutely right. You know, my wife has been teaching African-American history. Um, it's her second year to a homeschooling group. Oh, wow. And she's been eating up book after book. So one of the yes, brothers yes, yes. Um, had a, a passing in his family and he dropped off six totes of books. It was so much literature. It blew my mind. I love it. This sister had, I mean, every country on the continent of Africa, there was a book for it or some saying about it or some essays about it. Like it was really, really a detailed collection that she has. And I was just like, man, you could spend a lifetime searching our history. When I think about the movie Hidden Figures, mm -hmm. I wonder how many more are just hidden. What did we create that was stolen when they created patents, copyrights, <laughs> all of these things that we had no knowledge of that they just consumed the rights to and took credit for it? How many hidden figures do we have somebody put a post up on LinkedIn? This is the today's the first day I learned that we had black pilots, female pilots during World War II. I had no clue. Mm. I think I had just learned a few years ago that there were white or women who were flying bombers during World War II. And these are just things that we don't find in our history books that tell a true depiction and truth should not be a shadow. Uh, that's going to take over the world. Truth is truth. It'll make us free. It'll bring us closer to living in some type of harmony or living peaceably mm -hmm. with all men. All so men. as a father now, because I got to speak, I, I have not been great at this. As a father and for the parent, even parents out there, how do we now say, you know what? The Erudition Network is out here. I'm not allowed to be ignorant anymore. Mm. Mm. You speaking something right there. You speak the the one of the major issues that we have with erudition. Um, my son helps me out greatly. Is that you know I, my mom, my mother. You know, I, I appreciate what you just said. I got to touch on that sharing of knowledge. You know, I posted the other day. I got. People, I see people, and I ain't clowning nobody, but they do their 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 podcasts and stuff. And they got the bookcases behind them, and I got book. I got I, I have totes and totes of books. Um, I, I've always been an avid reader. My mother used to read to me. My father says when I was a baby, my mother would sit there, and it always chokes me up. And she would, I couldn't even say words, and she would read to me, just to see if I would reiterate what she was saying, and it it inspired me to read right and to, to study to grow and that's why i i, I you know i'm a, i'm an autodidic I, I i i'm always trying to learn but what i tell parents and what i would say is that the system here is so strong because it's a it's it's a it's a multi-central system we have to start at some level i remember you a couple of years ago i told a brother i said if you don't know the history if you don't think you know it then be man enough to tell to say, hey, I don't know, son, but let's go here and learn together. There are mentors. There are, there are people out here. Their erudition is an example, but there are many others, right, who will provide and help you and get you where you need to be. Everything we do on erudition, we source and resource. And I do that for a reason. People say, well, why, why are you always posting all these books? Because knowledge here is it doesn't benefit anybody if I just keep it here, right? I have to be able to say, hey, I read That's this. Right. You go out and you go read this and you go learn too. See, because I'm not clowning people, but I will say like when I see people like Umar Johnson, different people who I who speak history, right? I, I tell my son all the time, one thing we will not do is we are not going to bloviate and talk to you about history. And then once we finish with all of the show and the pop and everything else, you go, well, what do I learn that from? What, what, what do I, how do I, how do I increase my knowledge? We're going to always tell you, 
you can go here, go here. I have Tony. I got accounts with Cambridge Library, I, Library of Congress. I, I'm constantly reading something. If I'm not reading it, I'm playing it in the background, right? So I'm constantly read. Even if I think I know a subject, well, what's this person's thought on it, right? What did they write about it? What did they discover? Parents need to be doing that. We let our children go and do. I have four boys to go play video games and things like that. Sometimes we got to pull them in and look at the real world and say, listen, you see this right here? This is bad. And then work it backwards. Why did that happen? Why do they feel this way? Why do they think this way? Right. And work it backwards. Take a take a moment in history, a case, a person. Right. And build on that. And then once you do that, you go down one stream, that's going to lead you someplace else. Right. And you go, well, well, who was I to be Wells? If I, my sons looked at the people's grocery, right? They didn't know what the people, nobody ever taught them about the people's grocery. And I said, okay, we're going to talk about that because we need to understand that these men were killed and lynched out of jealousy. But one of them was a friend, a close personal friend of Ida B. Wells. Well, now who's Ida B. Wells, right? Well, we don't know too much about her dad. Maybe she was, I was like, maybe she, there was a project in Chicago, whatever. No, let's go further. Who was she? What did she do? And go from there. <laughs> that's how you learn. Yeah, that that's good. I, I grew up in, yeah, I, I grew up in Ida B. Wells part of my life. And that, I didn't know who Ida B. Wells was then. Mm -hmm. um, Robert Taylor Holmes, all of these homes um, that were named after famous yeah. uh, black people. But they didn't tell but you. The conditions in which they no, they they never told us, um, and I think that that's the issue that we have with the education system and taking it off of the education system now is what I believe what your network is all about. Saying, "Hey, parents, we already know what schools haven't been teaching in America mm -hmm. for the last seventy-five years. It's not their job anymore. It's your job to inform. It's your job to educate. Good and good. now that you have knowledge, it's time for you to put that into." practice. And I think that's the trick. Um, and that's, you know, having it hard with teenagers, um, <laughs> well, a, a teenager, you know, and in, in increasing that type of knowledge, it's challenging, but it's so necessary to just have her listening at times. Like you just, you just need to sit down, baby, and listen and to what's listen. going on. I know you don't want to hear it. It'll make sense to you later on in life when it comes back around. My son told me, he said that he likes to watch, uh, Trevor Noah, right? He said, I watch Trevor Noah because at least he'll joke about some of the painful things that are going on. And one of the things that me and my wife have always tried to do, and and and, and I think it was God given guidance, because we didn't know, was that we try to reach our children at that level of understanding. If it and, and I say that to say, if your child's level of understanding, I have a, a nine year old who I put him on a program not too long ago. And, and basically told people, I try so hard when I was a little, he, nine years old now, says that when I was a little kid, I, I tried to believe everything was good. But then I looked and I realized some people don't like me because of my color. And that's crazy. They don't like me because of the way I look. They don't like me because of the way I live, the, the, the things I do. And if he could understand that as a nine-year-old, people sell it short and say, well, I don't want my kids to, to, to experience this. You better get them to understand because this system out here is designed to kill. It is designed to destroy and imprison. And if we don't make them smarter and prepare them as parents, whatever we have to show them, because our ancestors lived for a reason. They lived so that we are their hope. And if we can understand that simple part, that we are their hope, right? They A lot of them died in graves, died in unknown places with the hope that, I'm doing this. This is better for, for 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 those who come after me. Then I think we would be a lot better. I think we would be a lot stronger in how we teach. Man, that's that's really, 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 really good. You know, I, I think one of the interesting pieces, as I think about it, when it comes to history, is having to understand. Because I know I was in a place where, you know, childhood trauma can really impact you, and only thing you're thinking about is survival. Oh, <laughs> and without a, without a, without a history context, 
without a history context, you just think you're in survival mode, not knowing that our ancestors in America, they've always born in trauma and born in survival mode. And we just did not have that kind of historical context or reference to understand the deepness of the struggle and the liberation that comes with being a part of the struggle. Man. And to be able to engage young people now, super challenging. But I know that this generation is hungry for knowledge and they're yeah. not just believing anything anymore. You know, and, and even I'll say that even being a Christian, they're like, yeah, that's cool. You Christian. That's cool. You Muslim. That's cool. You Jewish. We need to understand history, period. What y'all what y'all own? What y'all about? What's the context? They want eyes dotted. They want things crossed because this generation is not just a generation that believes they need to be shown yeah, yes. living examples of faith, living example yes. of faith walks. Right. And yes. so. The struggles that we're having now uh, in Judaism, in Christianity, in Islam, it's across the board with this generation of young people across the world. And they're just saying, y'all been doing this and jacking up this world for a long time. They want they want they want that's answers. why I started off talking about the comments. Yeah, they, they want answers. They and want and answers, that's why I started off talking about why is it? Why is it that we don't want LeBron James to be greater than Michael Jordan? Mm. And I think there's something in that. And I may not tap into it the right way, but there's something about not wanting to see that man succeed that I think is sending a message to a generation of young people that they actually just don't care. Well, people want to believe. I love MJ. Rock they want to believe, man. They want to believe. They want to believe that uh, there, there's an old uh, song um from the group uh genesis phil collins them and there was a part in that song I, it, it was playing on something the other day and i was like it was like our generation is uh is gonna make people something something i was like well that's a lie your generation didn't do any of that um i think there's a generational thing here um that happens where people feel like hey man um we didn't quite do what we needed to do right uh in our generation and we don't want to own so a lot of us don't want to own that right or we don't ever want to believe that something could be better something could be uh uh people can learn that why can't we just say that someone like lebron james took an example for someone like michael jordan and said or or like a kobe bryant said and i want to i want to be as good if not better than than, than him i i i want to i want to take it to another level right just like michael jordan may have looked at someone like dr j and and, and said hey you know i want to go i want to go further with this we have to understand that as a people, yes. we can get better. But I want to touch on some of what you said here about that survival thing. That's a psychological issue that black folks, see, it, it, it plays a part in our history. We have lived in the survival mentality for so long that we do not really get it in our heads that we're living in a survival mode. When I, when I grew I, I used to go, to go to high school right across the street from Cabrini Green. And I, I, I for, for four years of school, and people always say, oh, Eddie, you're, you're such a smart, you sister, you, you're a nerd, you're this. You have no idea too much about my background, things I've had to see. But when you live in a survival mode, survival is not a natural mode. You're not thinking, and I, and I always hate to use this connotation, but if you look at it in, in the mentality of a dog, right? A, do a dog, a domesticated dog has been taught to follow certain things outside of its primal thought. Man, if you think in a primal way all the time, primal is survival. I got to eat. I got to do. I, I'm just trying to live. When our kids live in that survival mode, they make survival decisions, right, of life and death. When we say, why did a young man go out there and shoot a woman and a child? Right. Because in his survivalist mind, he's not thinking like a cognitive conscious human being. He's thinking about survival. Well, I'm a, I'm this. I'm that. My boys is looking at me. If I drop my my persona, my image of myself and I don't do this violent thing. Right. Then all of a sudden I lose. I'm not going to survive. These animals who are running with me may do something to me. Right. And we don't think like that. And I'm not justifying murder and criminality. But what I am saying is that survival has been our way of living. 
black men who were on the plantation who could not be a part of their family's lives or, 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 or women who were, I told this, I told people the other day, 14 year old girls who were forced to have sex to initiate them into the idea of their womanhood by slave owners, right? Because, and as one woman, one slave wrote, she said, if he, when he pulled me into the, into, the, into, the, into the woods and he had his way with me, how do I say no when he holds the power of life and death over me? This is a survival mentality. <laughs> and we have to come out of that. And we have to start, start understanding we're not animals. We're not in a survivalist mentality. We can live. So many black people do not believe they can live. What, what, what's the name say? Uh, 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 uh. You uh, you got to do it. You, you always want to do something until you die. Right. H hustle, f fight, do whatever. Listen to the words that we're using in our, in, in our struggle. Right. You know, uh, Dick, Bob Dick Gregory said that black women are never really told that they're beautiful. They always told that they are strong and faithful. Right. And if you tell a woman that you strong and you faithful, but you never take the time to say, but you also are beautiful, you beautiful to me. Right. What do you what do we tell our young girls? You got to be a strong black woman. What does that mean? She could be strong and beautiful. Right. So that survival thing is a huge part. Tony. I wanted to touch on that. No, that, that, that's good. And it's rich. And I want to stay there for a little bit because I just finished watching um, a documentary. Uh, I think it's by Tariq Nasheed mm -hmm. um, called Buck Breaking. Now, I'm not I know you know what that what that term means. I'm not we're not going to get into the details of this documentary because some will find it offensive. Yeah. But I want to acknowledge what a queen in there said. She said or a young black lady. I know everybody doesn't like the word expression queen, young black lady. She said that we're the only race of women that's told to be a strong black woman. Mm, mm, mm. She said, you don't say have a strong Chinese woman. You don't say have a strong white woman. You don't say have a strong Latino woman like she just talked about the implications that are placed on black women by society and the dangers of black women buying into that we strong mentality. And I wanted to bring that up and specific, specifically to make it personal. You know, I feel like I've lived a, a vast majority of my life in survival mode. Mm -hmm. I, I think today wow. when I got up and picked up the word and went outside and read, it was probably the first day I resolved to rest in the Lord and whatever comes, it's just going to have to come it's have to come to cut loose the anxiety and the worry, because that comes with survival mode, stress, <laughs> shoulders that feel like shoulder pads on a football field for the front line. It's so much anxiety is built up in survival mode. You never get to live. My pastor, Dr. Brazier said something last week and two weeks ago in prayer in the morning. He said, you don't have to wake up and go to war every day. And I was like, why he in my business? <laughs> but he was so right. That survival mode just keeps us turned on to say, black man, it's never going to be enough. You got to keep the hustle. Mm -hmm. You got to keep pushing. You got to keep working 90 jobs. Mm -hmm. You got to stay up all night and do the work for the company because, you mm -hmm. know, you can't, you can't slip because you're a black man. You got to work three times as harder as a white man. Like all of these things and conditions that we place upon ourselves that were never meant for us to carry. Not at all. But, you know, we carry them because uh, my wife said something in the program yesterday. We carry them because and I heard uh, uh, um, one of these comedians say because we have been taught also. See, at the heart of it, there are certain things that come through through our ancestral lines. At the heart of it, our ancestors taught us that we are better people. We are strong people. That comes through. But we get but they but somewhere in that, because of the struggle and the and the, and the symbiosis of slavery, we have taken on this harshness, this anger. And white a lot of white racists are so worried that the other foot is gonna fall and we're gonna do something to them. But because we are an internalized people, and we have always been by African an internalized self-aware people we hurt ourselves we turn on ourselves and we we hurt each other before we will even go hurt the other and and, and it's a strange phenomenon and it, it it comes from slavery too it, it really enforced in slavery um because we couldn't strike against them so we struck against each other when you look at the the document you were talking about 
and the, and the horrific things that they did to us as black men and black women. But when they took the idea of your manhood, your strength of purpose and character, your guidance of your family from you, when they stripped that from you so that you didn't have that identity, they also stripped that from your sons and your son's sons. And so when we get our minds around the understanding that we, it, it's, it's hidden. I keep, God put that in my spirit not too long ago. He said that it ain't stolen, it's hidden. I did not let them take that from you and your people. It's just hidden. And the idea you, you mentioned in the movie earlier, Hidden Figures, we need to understand that. See, they can't hide that history. They can't hide the, the truth of who we are and the strength of what we have. Uh, the, 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 the inventors, the people who created the radiators, the, the, the refrigerators, blacks who created these things out of necessity in order to allow the white man to get off their back, off their neck, right? To make it easier for them to do their jobs. Uh, I remember I was watching something and Dick Gregory said, when they went over to Africa, they didn't take the worst. They didn't go take the criminals. They took the strong, mm. the beautiful, right? Man, she looks good. He looks strong. They took the intelligent. They took the skilled workers. The Beanie tribe was was were, were skilled workers before the white man ever started the, the, the American slavery. We know that because when they would sell slaves that went the other uh, to the other side, right? They they were indentured, right? The, 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 the Muslims used them to help them grow their empire. And then they would, they would free them. That's the difference. Chattel slavery was the taking of everything. Everything that came out that woman, yes. everything, they, they, they had nothing that they owned of their own, right? So when we understand that that's the thing, that's the, that's, they knew who we were. Too often we when you go look at studies, you find, as I just said, white men who white women who historians find information, they know who we are. They know who we are better than we do sometimes. Right? I was telling Pastor Razor, I said he was writing a book, his book, his new book that is out. Uh and, and, and I was like, you he he wrote that book for a purpose. But I was telling him, I said, you know, there's a man named Charles Carroll who wrote a book, right? Uh uh, about, about the Negro, right? Because uh, the Negro, the beast, or the image of God, and Charles Carroll, Carroll was a was a was a a preacher. He was a scientist. He was this. He was this. He was well acclaimed. But he told these people that we were animals, beasts of the field. That we were described in the Bible as the wild, right? And they talked about this in their little book, in their little book clubs, and, and this book sold was a, was a was a bestseller. Thomas Dixon wrote the Klansman. He sold the idea of the Klan, this, 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 this beautiful, righteous Klan, which was a lie. But they believed it because they had to have the idea, why do I want these black people? Why do they have to be around us? There has to be a reason. So let me give it a, a religious reason, a psychological reason, a philosophical reason, right? But I, I, some of us know the truth. We're just going to hide it. I know that was a lot. <laughs> yeah, that that's real. I, no, no, that, it was good though. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm learning. I'm here to learn. I, I wrote down Charles Carroll's name. Okay, like I'm here to learn too. So you know, yeah. take some notes and do do my own research. Yeah. You know, Minister Farrakhan was talking about um, our associations with other organizations and how even they were divided. Specifically, he was talking about the difference between. Um, Freemasons who are black and Freemasons who are white. Mm. And I'm paraphrasing him, and you can find it on YouTube, but he talked about, I, I put in a flow on Facebook a couple of weeks ago. I said, if they only let you see at 33 degrees, that means you 327 levels behind, behind me. Right. And that's what, you know, the minister was alluding to. He was saying that they know who we are. Yes. They know the history of our people. They know why we were created and formed. They know why we're here. And you will only be kept at 33 degrees because they don't want you to see 327 more. Because as long as they can keep it in from you. The, 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 Go ahead. Yes. 
Yeah, just the, the power behind behind that statement. And again, I'm paraphrasing him. The power behind that statement just means that we don't have the knowledge of our histor historical context on the planet. Mm. Because when Cologne, when, when colonialism started, it hit a, it found a lot and hit a lot. I remember watching, and every now and then I'll pull up an episode of Saturday Night Live with Richard Pryor when they found when he found the uh, the Egyptian pyramid, and when he went inside and he opened up one of the scrolls, and he was like, "Man, these is black people. I can't wait till the brothers find this out." And mm -hmm. then they had the white guys lock him inside of the pyramid, so nobody got so word did not get out. I had a doctor, she was a neurosurgeon, and I was in her office taking care of some technology one day. Mm -hmm. And she looked at me and she said, Tony, did you know that Egyptians were the first brain surgeons? Yes. And I was like, yeah, I think I heard something about it. And she said, I'm white. <laughs> I should not know more about my, your history than you. Yes. But we got to understand, Tony, that they are and taught that, that history. I didn't really have they know our history. Yes, that, that's, that's the thing, right? The KKK, look, the KKK, when they formed, I was saying the other day, we're talking about the first, second, and third clan. Every one of those formations of the clan was designed around the suppression of black people. It was designed to keep us uh, relegated to what they wanted us to be. It's the fear of us understanding more about ourselves, who we are, what we are. When you talk about the Egyptians, when you talk about the Carthaginians, when you talk about the, uh, well, I was telling Pastor, uh, man, Pastor was talking about the, the, the Canaanites, the Phoenicians. When you talk about the, the black people and how we have nurtured, cared for, I'm not making that up. That's historical. You can follow us and see how we nurtured and cared for people all over this planet. When you look at the idea of the fulsome people who came over to the uh, to, to the what is it the, the southwest of America, and I, I asked about that in that test, right? And people got mad, going, "What do you mean the fulsome people came over here fifteen thousand years ago?" Yes, because we know that they came over here because they left their spears. The, the white man went and found the spears and said, "Look, hey, these ancient people built these wonderful things, right?" We know that uh, blacks were over here before Columbus got here because Columbus's own journals say, state that, hey, there were black men who came from the, the, the east and the south and came up and showed us how to create these spears and lace it with gold, right? We know that the Portuguese knew that the blacks had been over here because when they drew the line after Columbus' first, first voyage over here, right, they said, hey, Y'all can have whatever is over here, but we want everything that goes this way. Why? Because they knew that blacks had been over here. They also knew that as slavery was going, because they knew that the, the, the Muslims were already enslaving and using some blacks as indentured servants, right? They knew the intelligence. So there's no surprise that the Portuguese were the leaders in the beginning of the slave trade, right? And that they, they contracted the Essential de Negro to the Spanish to get the permission to transit slaves all over the, all over the, the, the Atlantic. Our history is, is long. Yes. It is splendid. And a lot of us don't know it because like we said, they hide it. And then when we find the truth, when we say, hey, wait a minute, there's some truth here. They say, well, that hasn't really all been figured out. And, uh, you know, I have, I have historian friends who argue with me about the, they say, we don't call them African Phoenicians, Eddie. Don't, don't call them that. I was like, but they're from Africa. They, they were in Africa. Uh, well, what are they? Well, you know, they call Phoenicians. They come from Africa, man. Or they come from, they, they, they came from Lebanon. Do you realize that they were a huge, huge uh, 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 kingdom and that they were all over and that they inspired the Greeks, the Romans? So you, you took this knowledge, the, the Egyptians. The Nubians, all of this knowledge that came out of Africa that went north into Europe. And we don't even praise the African. We don't give their African African no credit. And that's what that's what deliberates, 
right? We give him no credit, but we talk about the Romans. We talk about the Greeks. We talk about the Vikings coming in and killing and murder. We talk about everything else, right? We talk about the Irish, right? Let's We move into the modern centuries. But we don't realize when the Irish came over here, a lot of the riots, we were talking the other day, were Irish people. They didn't attack other whites. They went and attacked the black man because they felt that the black man was a threat. He was a better skilled worker. He had, he had a greater work ethic. This is from their own testimonials. They burned down New York. They killed thousands of black people in this country yeah. out of jealousy, out of anger, because of the idea of knowing who you are better than you do. It's crazy. It's, it's interesting you bring up the New York piece because I didn't even I didn't know that until I was watching the gangs of New York and what took place. So I was just let me see if there's any truth to this story. It's in the. Wow. There the is draft truth wire to is this. Horrible. The draft wires are horrible because they don't they don't tell you. Right. It, they don't tell you. The draft wires of 1863. So we're, so, we're bad. Go ahead. What's what's next for your network and how can we get your word out about the network? So because I say I ask because I don't mind being put on front street like you didn't require anybody when they took that quiz to say what they scored at all. I chose to walk in humility and say, yo, I bombed this quiz. And so what's next for the network and what can we do to increase the knowledge of our young people to let okay. them know that your history did not start with slavery? 1619 is a part of it, but it's not the beginning. Amen. So we're doing a couple of initiatives. I have my oldest son, my 18 year old, he's helping me a lot. My 16 year old helped me out a lot. Um, cause I'm in Colorado and, I, and, and trying to get all this stuff done. And, um, but one of the things that the erudition is going to do, my son has been on me. We're going to start back into standalone lessons. Uh, we have a new show that we're, that I'm, I'm putting, I'm going to start, but I'm putting it in their hands and it's moments in people in black history. And basically what it is, is just five minute spills of different individuals, different people who interacted or black, black history so that we can have a place online a presence online to start off with so when your kids have questions about whoever right um louis latimer or, or whoever and they want to know who is this person they can get that five minute spiel but at the end of each one of these episodes we will source to you books places and things to go um and i always try to emphasize the free because i want knowledge should be free right uh, if I can't find it, I have to give you something on Amazon. We'll do that. So that's one of our first our, our first initiatives. Secondarily, what we're going to do, um, where I'm having some work on my websites right now, um, we are you, we do an interactive every week. Uh, I'm painstakingly come in on Thursdays and try to do an interactive. And I use my kids. I bring them on because I want young people to get involved. I want families. And every time we, we post this interactive, Tony, I tell people, come uh, to watch the interactive, bring a history book, ask questions while we're, while we're interacting. But I, I would be remiss to say that one of the things that I, I, I stress with erudition, and I hold us, myself, and anybody involved with it, is we teach you real history. We do not, I will not allow um, myth, rumor, sophistry, casuistry to be put Right. And so we tr represent you validated history. So that is what we're doing. Um, we're trying to grow this. I, I'm trying not to move too fast in growing it. So it's out of my control and, and, and it gets crazy. But I um, I, I just want us to, to be able to learn. We do have another <laughs> we have another test that's coming out. Um, there'll be about 11 questions. I try to do I try to give everybody an extra question. Uh, just just a freebie. Um, but this this new test will talk about some of the things that we have actually talked about in a lot of the interactive uh, live streams. But it will touch on more modern history where we are right now. 
uh, where we are with, with black criminality, criminality, uh, lynching, racism, uh, why we've gotten to this point, the, the Klan, different things like that. Um, and so it, I expect people will do better on this because we've lived through some of this. Uh, and so that's kind of what we got in line right now. Excellent, 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 excellent. Well, look, man, I appreciate you taking time out of your day to come <laughs> on to Tony Briscoe Live. I'm going to keep this moving, and, and one day I'll get my internet straight, man. I don't I don't know when. I'm paying a whole lot of money for Comcast right now, and I'm not feeling the love get, being given back <laughs> at all when it comes to this internet connection. But, you know, uh, I, you know, I, I love this. I, I love interviewing people, and I'm grateful. And, you Anytime. know, just continue to tag me in your work. Like, I'm not one of them people that say, don't tag me on my Facebook page. No, tag me. If I can be oh, there, yeah, I want to be there, especially for that next quiz, too. So I can so I can make sure I stay on my game. Yeah, man, you well. come up. Um, you, give some you, final you, thoughts for the people. So final thoughts. Um, one of the things that that I want to touch on, uh, you know, on the on the last test that I, that, that we talked about, um, I talked about the Quasili uh, word of Sasha and Zumani. Right. Um, we need to understand those words and apply them to our lives. That's a part of our history. Right. Sasha being the recently deceased ancestors who left us stuff here for us to learn, the Malcolm X's, but they're not fully moved out of our plane of understanding. And we need to start bringing back names out of the Zumani, which are our, our, our long dead ancestors who left us this history. That's what happened with Tulsa, this hidden. We have so much in the Zumani that we need to be able to bring back. So strive to question and to learn uh, uh, like I said, follow different tracks that'll lead you to other tracks. Um, and once we do that, I think we'll be better because we'll know better more about our worth, who we are, and what we can do and what we have done. Excellent. 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 Thank you, my brother. I appreciate no you definitely for coming on. Thank you so Anytime. much. Appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, you just heard from brother Eddie Phillips of the Erudition Network here to teach African history, African-American history, and our world that began long before 1619 when it comes to African-Americans, black people uh, as a whole and as a collective. And so, so glad you took the time out to tune in on this week. I appreciate you all. Thanks for joining me. Thank you. And a shout out to Horace at Be In The Mix and the Be In The Mix family um, that is out there. How will I close this week? You know, we've had athletes that have knocked out their girlfriends and get reinstated and welcome back. We've had athletes that have been accused of multiple accounts of rape and have still been quarterbacks. We have had athletes that have just, you know, done the unthinkable and we still support them. We've had athletes who've been involved in shootings who've been able to get themselves back on the field. but. When we have an athlete that stands up and says, you know, my mental health is more important than this game right now. There's an outcry of anger, of resentment. Stand by your people. You don't know what everybody's going through. My dear friend, Alicia Nicole, lost her dad, and I don't expect her to be the same for a very long time. My brother, Coming up on the one year anniversary of the murder of his son, he's not going to be right for a very long time. People need their mental space for whatever reason they need their mental space. Give people room to grow and be. It is your boy, Tony Briscoe. Take care, everybody. I'm out of here. Put your hands in the air if you hip hop. And some of y'all making moves need a hip stop. They're getting shots, no problem.